All right, so I don't know about you, but I live up in Bloomfield and lost power last weekend, this weekend, and I've been kind of living at Starbucks. <laughs> Special card or something. But uh, so I was putting together these minute and I uh, wanted to share with you how got started, why the French uh, Alliance Francaise is involved, right? So I'm with uh, the Alliance Francaise, I'm the president of the board, and I have several of our directors here, our executive director, Francoise, and uh, we wanted to engage more in the city of Detroit and the cultural share our program well. And I was going through the museum um, in the summer and saw this Albert Kahn exhibit. It really impressed me. I grew up in Detroit, didn't really realize the history, and learned some about that, something about that. But at Lyon's France says we're celebrating our 140th year this year, and Detroit Historical Society is celebrating their 100th year. And uh, Villa Albertine is. Uh, actually producing the Night of Ideas globally. It's in over 100 countries, 20 cities in the United States happening all this week. I think we got the last one coming to. So we have the Night of, the, Night of Ideas in the afternoon. So um, they put out a theme. This actually was started in 2016. It's in the program there by Institut Francaise that uh, to bring together thinkers, artists, uh, to discuss ideas and provoking thoughts about issues of the day. This was in 2016. And they had such, such success that they continued it since then, and it's produced by Villa Albertine, which is part of the French Cultural Services Group out of the French Embassy. So that's how we got involved. They contact the Alliance Francaise. They try and get us involved locally, produce events, because it's not just about the language courses that we provide but it's also about engaging with community culturally, French culture, American culture, world culture. So that's why we're here today to discuss some of these things. So the theme they had was more. And when I got this, I said more. <laughs> they did give a little more description to it, and I pulled one of the lines here that we really focused on, is really you know, facing population and environmental challenges today and growth. You know, how do we meet those challenges? for humanity, for efficient production, sustainable technologies. And today we're hearing all these, it seems to be kind of a existential threats. Where it's always the fear of the future. And I wanted to talk and have a discussion about excitement about the future, things that we're doing here in Detroit. And I think we got some great things to talk about and uh, provoke some thoughts. So we're going to have some Q&A at the end of the afternoon, but also, after our first speaker, we're going to have a Q&A for him specifically because he's getting on an airplane and leaving town. <laughs> so, some things you may not know, uh, as I was looking at this, uh, ah, welcome. <laughs> some things you may not know uh, beyond what we're going to talk about today and the Michigan Central Station is there's a lot of great things, resurgence here in Detroit going on. We were just recognized uh, as a city of design by UNESCO. And Detroit is the only city in the United States that's received that recognition, right? So you can look that up. Architectural Digest at the top, they're the one they had it in their latest magazine as well. And also Detroit Institute of Arts was just named the best art museum in the country. Yes, it was just announced. And um, who went to see Van Gogh exhibit? It was the only Van Gogh exhibit like that in the country curated everything, private collectors and everything. I, I saw it three times, that's good. But these are great jewels that we have here in Detroit. So we're gonna talk about, you know, turn of the century, how Detroit started from uh, the automotive revolution and how Detroit grew to a population of over two million. And then we had to decline. And I think we're seeing a new resurgence and we're gonna talk about that today. And part of it is around Michigan Central. So this is the train station here that was built, I think, finished in 1914. And we're going to also talk about um, Ford Motor bought this. They've been quietly working in the background. And we wanted to share some of the things that were going on and what's, what that means for Detroit. And also, not only Michigan Central uh, train station, or train, excuse me, Michigan Central Station, 
And I should say, James, you told me too, it's Michigan Central Depot, right? Yeah. And the book Depository, uh, designed by Albert Kahn, and how that connects literally to this Michigan Central. And here's the book Depository. And there's a tunnel underneath that connects these two. I understand you can drive a car through it. So I can't wait to hear more about this as well and what's going on in that building and who's going to be there. And here is, I mentioned the turn of the century <laughs> uh, as we were growing. Uh, this is a manifest from Ellis Island, and that's my grandfather coming through in 1920. He was a trained chef at Hotel uh, Mont Blanc in Chamonix, and he jumped on the boat here, came over to from Switzerland, French-speaking Switzerland, to Detroit with $50 in his pocket, and my grandmother, too. <laughs> and uh, he worked at Joe Muir's for 30 years. And if you ever go to Joe Muir's, who's going to Joe Muir's? Ever have the cream spinach? Mm -hmm. My grandfather's recipe. I've got his notebooks from his apprentissage where he had that recipe. He came down from the mountains of Switzerland where they were starving and jumped on the boat, came to Detroit, and uh, here I am. <laughs> so I just thought that was interesting. It kind of had a personal touch. So growing then, the automotive, now Michigan Central is again going to be the epicenter for Detroit, and I kind of call it the Silicon Valley of the Midwest. I think we have an opportunity here. It's an incubator developing within Michigan Central and uh, Book Depository. In addition to Michigan Central by Ford, there's a company, a group called No Lab, and you can look these folks up as well. In addition to Michigan Central and Ford being there with their mobility teams, New Lab is going to be bringing companies in that are incubator companies for all kinds of design and thought and to reimagine really mobility and sustainable development. And so we'll learn. To do this, we took this old Michigan Central and Book Depository and had to transform it. And I haven't seen any of this yet, but we'll, no one's physically gone in there. I think maybe in another year they'll let us in there. But we'll hopefully get today get an idea of what, how it was redesigned and reimagined. Okay. So we're going to talk on and this topic, and this is our agenda today. Uh, after the introduction, we're going to have a bozo. A representative from Bozlaw I'll introduce in a moment, speaking on sustainable clean energy technology, how we're taking renewables and being able to store them in fuel cells and leverage renewable energy. And I don't know enough about it, but Cedric will tell us more. Uh, then we'll have Detroit Historical Society and Albert Kahn, uh, which had an exhibit here. Uh, we're going to have someone from Albert Kahn, Michael uh, Giovanni, speak to us about um, Albert Kahn and his impact in Detroit and Book Depository. And then finally, we'll have Devin Anderson, who's going to talk. He's with Quinn Evans. That They're the architects of Michigan Central Design, the Book Depository. So they have hands-on on what's going on. So we have the inside scoop. Okay? All right. So first of all, I wanted to... Bozal is a company out of the Netherlands, right? And we're lucky to have Cedric Ballaram uh, with us today. Fred Cedric uh, was the president of the French American Chamber of Commerce here in Detroit for 10 years. He's been an automotive executive with For Forisia Valio, I think, as well. No, not Valio, Forisia, pardon. <laughs> and uh, I think he went to schema school in France. Yeah, so he's got all the tools here. But he's here to, uh, I asked Cedric, told him what we were doing. I thought this would be a great topic for this audience to talk about how things are being transformed and what we're doing to have more sustainable development and technology. So I'm excited to hear about that. And after Cedric's done, we will take some questions immediately because he does have to catch a plane. So I thank him for being here. Okay? Cedric. Thank you very much, David. So it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Uh, as David indicated, my name is Cedric, Cedric Ballarin. I'm the executive vice president in charge of a division of a company called Bozal. Bozal is a, is a tier one automotive supplier, uh, but that specializes into exhaust systems. And as you have heard in the news, the combustion engine is on its last leg, or at least the, 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 
the trend is set relative to the termination of the, uh, the combustion engine in vehicles, and therefore every associate systems, like exhaust. So the company is pivoting away from uh, exhaust system and automotive, and is looking for new applications. And there is one application in particular, which I'm going to detail later on, which is a heat exchanger for solid oxide fuel cell, solid oxide electrolyzer. So very, very complicated words. And I will try to, to give you a glimpse of what that means, what the future, what we, what we can foresee as being the future in the realm of, of uh, energy and how my company in particular position itself in relation to that changing landscape. So that's it. I hope it's a great idea. Uh, going back to uh, Villa Albertine and we're going back to the night of idea, the whole concept of energy is really an, um, a progressing idea in society today, and you, hear, you will hear more and more about it. So here we go. So. Um, What's going on? So you, you, you have heard of those things. You have actually heard of those things. You have heard of the Inflation Reduction Act, $369 billion that have been signed into uh, law by the, the Biden administration, uh, which, uh, uh, trend, or which focus on boosting local production of uh, zero carbon forms of energy, establishing transportation infrastructure, favoring use and consumption of these forms of energy. Europe is right behind, 210 billion euro. China is right behind, 1 trillion RMB. So there is a lot of focus right now in that field, in terms of energy. Why? Well, because decarbonization and national slash regional energy sovereignty are at the top of the political agenda. This, this, if there are those two things I want you to remember out of this conversation today, those are those two things. Decarbonization, energy sovereignty. So why? Why are we there? Why such buzz? Why are every people talking about it? Well, you have the, the growth of the world population on the, on the right. So this is from uh, the last 15,000 years, okay? <laughs> and on the bottom, you have a consumption of energy. So we did not go all the way back to 12,000 BC, uh, but we started at 1800, so beginning of the uh, industrial age. Industrial age, burning of coal up to today. And basically, you have a curve relative to the consumption of energy that is almost mimic population. On the left, you have uh, the consumption per habitant in the world. So in the, in the Stone Age, you're, sorry, yeah, Stone Age, Middle Age, uh, so kilowatt per hour in the world 2019. So I think we are at 51, 55 uh, kilowatt hour per, per, per inhabitant on Earth. But there is a, 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 this is an average, and when you look at the distribution geographically, you will see that Americans are very energy -vore. I mean, we consume a lot of energy. I mean, two, so uh, compared to an average of 55, Americans consume 220, 230 kilowatts. Germany is less, China, India is very low at 15 or 20. What happens when China and India are going to be at the same level as the US? Well, this curve is going to go exponential, absolutely exponential. So the, the need for energy is growing exponentially. You have a demand for energy. Those today, you're consuming fossil energy. Those resources are scarce or they are limited. They will drive, I mean, like a, a lot of uh, uncertainty uh, because of the, 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 the race for those sources of energy. Um, this growth is met with a diversified mix of energy. So basically, uh, petroleum and other liquids pretty much flat. So we are going to continue to consume gas, petrol as long as we can. Uh, nuclear, biofuels uh, are flat as well. Natural gas is growing. Um, renewable forms of energy is growing and coal is going down. So this is kind of the trend going on today. Um, so renewable are part of the winning mix. So if you want to invest into a form of energy for tomorrow, renewable is one of those that are growing. They are growing, being driven by solar and wind. 
for the most part. So these are just indicative of the geographical, uh, let's say, distribution. Every region of the world is investing in those, pretty much. Uh, added benefit of reduced CO2 emission. So as you get the windmill or the, the solar panel to operate, you actually reduce your CO2 emission, so it's, it's, it's real. Uh, depending on the, uh, the, the industry that you look at, whether it's power, industry, transportation, buildings. And uh, I, I apologize for the, the font, so there is something uh, that went off. But basically, um, renewable are part of the future, but renewable have a significant drawback. And that drawback is that they are intermittent in nature for production. Number one. And number two, you store very poorly electricity. So I come back to the first one. Produ intermittent production, well, that means that when there is no wind, the windmill is not, uh, is not turning. When there is no sun, the, the, the electricity created by the solar panel is much less than what you need. And that intermittence is disconnected from the consumption patterns. So the consumption patterns you consume a lot between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. at night. You have certain industry geographically that consume more than some residential area. You have a whole pattern of consumption, which by nature does not fit the production pattern. So um, you need storage in between. Storing electricity is very complicated because you need batteries. Those batteries are very expensive. You have losses. It's not that easy. The medium that is being identified as the, the storage of energy of the future is hydrogen. And when you think of hydrogen, you start with the windmill, the way I was describing them here, with the wind, the solar panel. You can also have the coal or, or the, the existing uh, uh, power station uh, that, uh, that we all know, that we are, we are pulling from today. And you simply, I say simply, it's not that simple, but you simply electrolyze the electricity. And it's a, it's a mechanism, it's a, it's a physics, it's a, it's a physical experience that you probably have all done in your younger age. You take water, you put electricity, and you separate the, the molecule of hydrogen from oxygen. And you end up with hydrogen on one end. So if you electrolyze water, you end up with hydrogen. And at the end of the chain, you need a new form of, uh, let's say, generator that is going to take that hydrogen and transform it back into electricity. So this is the loop. Uh, this is the loop where we are looking for in the future. Uh, creation of electricity through renewable, uh, transformation of that electricity in hydrogen, transportation storage of that hydrogen, and retransformation for residential. You want to feed the electricity into your residential, into your uh, uh, industry, and you can also feed pure hydrogen to mobility. And pure hydrogen to mobility, where it goes into cars and through a, a different type of fuel cells, uh, you, you, you move the car on that, uh, on that form of energy. So Bozal, the company I work for, we, we operate in a niche. Uh, it's, a, it's a niche of a niche. And the niche is you have various types of so, uh, electrolyzer, you have various types of um, uh, fuel cells, uh, which are converting the hydrogen back into electricity. And there is one technology in particular that we call solid oxide. You have other technologies like PEM, a proton electron membrane. Proton electron membrane is the one that you will find in the mobility market. The one that I work on is for stationary application, it's called solid oxide. So, what I described to you earlier on, the, uh, uh, the, growing, popula oh, the growing population, the, 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 um, the conversion of a portion of the population to a higher standard of living is going to drive uh, a high, high demand for energy. We all understand that resources or levels of, uh, resources of energy are limited. And uh, you, you have to look for other alternative sources. The alternative sources based on renewable, in order to be efficient in our day-to-day -day life, requires a transformation through hydrogen. And this is launching a boom, absolutely a boom. But right now, 
So those, those uh, billions of dollars and euro being invested, they're invested in this right now. They're invested into the, the, the gross market of fuel cells, whether they're solid oxide or PEM. Uh, we are talking about a 22% uh, compounded uh, annual growth rate. So every year you add 20% more capacity in what you do and so on and so forth. Um, this, I think one is for SOFC, the other one is for electrolyzer. It's kind of the same, it tells the same story. And it's also uh, triggering a global race. A global race, uh, North America, Europe, uh, Asia, essentially China, are all competing for those technologies. And uh, behind that competition, you have a, a real concern relative to national sovereignty. And national sovereignty, this country is uh, um, uh, independent, energy independent today. It was not the case 20 years ago, but today it's energy independent because of the, the shell gas, uh, shell oil, and so on. But it's not going to last. Europe is entirely dependent on foreign imports. We saw what happened a year ago with the war in the Ukraine. There is a, a, a very uh, stark awakening in Europe right now relative to the vulnerability, relative to the supply of energy sources. So this whole story of renewable and conversion into hydrogen is also a matter of um, sovereignty. Uh, the countries, the, the regions, want to be able to rely on their own and our local forms of energy and not depend on others. So now I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do or what, what, uh, what Bozal uh, does. So um, we are a company uh, that uh, contributes to cleaner world, uh, constantly innovating in energy and mobility. Uh, so these are the two, uh, two pillars of the company. Uh, at a glance, so Euro, it's a family-owned company, 550 million uh, euro in revenue, 5% net sales re reinvested in R&D, uh, 16 production distribution centers, 6 engineering centers, 1,700 uh, employees worldwide. Uh, footprint, we are, oh, it doesn't show, but we are global in the sense that uh, uh, I'm based here in Livonia, but we have a plant in Mexico, a plant in Brazil, several plants in Europe and South Africa. And what we do, uh, we, we do heat and flow management uh, for those solid oxide fuel cells, gas to power, satellite electrolyzer, so a variety of applications. So um, what I'm showing you on the screen does not exist today, meaning you, can, you cannot go and buy one, but you will be able to buy one, let's say, two to six years from now. The, the, the timeline is still very much up in the air. Uh, the maturity of the system, I would say, is still, uh, is still questionable. But eventually, you can imagine that, um, like a hospital like Beaumont, like the, the, the train station, like uh, the Fort Depot, will be connected to a gas line. They will, so hydrogen or methane gas, uh, if, uh, that's, a good, that's one attribute of the SOFC, it can do both. So either hydrogen or methane gas, you can take your gas and you can generate electricity with a very high level of uh, energy conversion efficiency, 65% uh, to be, uh, to, to, to quote a number. Meaning, very soon, in the next two, let's say two, four, four years, you will be able to buy a generator, uh, which is what it is, that connects to a gas line that creates electricity using either gas or uh, hydrogen to feed electric electricity to your local uh, area. So whether it's an hospital, whether it's a mall, whether it's a, a residential a block of apartments, whether it's uh, uh, industries, um, and you're de delocated, so you're, de delocated, you're delocating the, uh, the production of electricity, you're decentralizing it, you don't rely on the grid, you're using Another source of energy, which is gas today, but which comes at a, at a, at a, at a cheaper price than other forms of uh, energy or electricity production. And you're able to feed independently from the grid, so you won't have to, to deal with the Starbucks anymore. Uh, we, we, you will be able to, uh, to manage uh, uh, electricity locally. Okay? Yeah. 
transfer. So essentially, we take the heat from the stack that creates the electricity, and we bring it around where it matters the most, and we take it out when we don't need it anymore. So we manage the heat and the flow around the stack. Uh, we can integrate certain uh, functionality like reforming, uh, which is eliminating the, the carbon or uh, the methane gas. That, that's not necessary for our hydrogen. It's modular, so one kilowatt to one megawatt, and we get very large systems. Um, and we customize, and we customize to our customers' needs. So durability is very important. Uh, so uh, those systems are designed to last five years, continuous operation for five years. And uh, energy, so you will have in the future, in the sh short future, uh, residential power generation at home, residential or uh, industrial generation uh, for data center, for example, which are extremely consumer of energy. You have the marine application, boats are also a very uh, good application where you can put a fuel cell, you can put hydrogen on a boat, and the boat goes on for a long, long time. Uh, ammonia, ammonia is also a derivative from, uh, from hydrogen. Uh, we have intellectual property in the, in the field, and we operate. We welcome you, all of you, to apply. So net zero carbon and everything we do is based on hydrogen. So yeah, something interesting when it comes to electrolyzers. Electrolyzers, if you're able to recuperate waste heat, so for example, you have a refinery that creates a lot of heat, or you're dispersing that heat in the atmosphere. Uh, you're, if you're able to recapture that heat somehow and you integrate it into the electrolysis process, you're able to convert energy at 100%. Or very close to 100%. So again, I imagine the windmill. If you create windmill where you create electricity, you recuperate waste heat, and together with that electricity, you create hydrogen, at almost 100% transfer of, of the energy uh, uh, value of that electricity. You have no loss through the system, which is quite, uh, quite interesting. Okay, so that's it. That's it. I concluded with the, vid with the video. So um, I'll, I'll be able to take a few questions, but the, the key for me being here today was to tell you that there is an, a revolution happening behind the scene right now. And that revolution is associated with the way we produce and consume energy. Uh, what you saw, the billions of euro dollars being invested of that is a sign uh, that the, the, the leadership in those countries is very well aware of the challenges to come. Uh, we have been sitting on some form of fossil energy for very long, so coal, gas, petroleum, and so on. And we all know that uh, those, uh, those forms of energy are finite. I mean, at one point in time, they will, they will come exhaust. That barrier has been pushed over time. You may remember some of you in the 70s, early 80s, everybody was talking about the oil uh, the end of the oil era, that era has been pushed back, but one thing is certain, we will not be able to push it back forever. Um, you, you have heard of the shell oil, huh? so in the US, shell oil, um, in Saudi Arabia, beginning of the 20th century, you are digging the earth, you would find oil. The ratio of how much you need to invest in terms of energy to extract a barrel of petrol was about 1 for 99. So you would, you would use one barrel of oil to extract 99 barrels of oil in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. In the US or in Canada today with Shell Oil, you invest one barrel of petrol, you get five. Okay? So you, 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 you get the sense. Huh? The curve is going slowly but surely going down to extinction. We are not going to be able to use fossil uh, form of energy very longer. Um, 
because of the scarcity, the rarity of those forms of energy, because of the growing population, because of the growing consumption rate of that very same population, we, we are getting into, into trouble. Renewable energy is the answer, or is part of the answer, and hydrogen is going to be the conduit you know, for uh, taking uh, that, that form of renewable energy, storing it and transporting it to your end uh, use and, and consuming use. That's it for me. I'll, I'm, I'm more than more happy to take questions. About a ratio. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm a teacher on the weekends who are sustainable supply chain, so I'm, I'm, this is fascinating to me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Your technology um, generator, the application is. Um, like a residential, commercial, like a stationary, and uh, marine, nuclear, something, you know, big stuff. Are you planning to use your technology for automotive, like a transportation? And also, uh, I don't know if you can disclose or not, but it is like, uh, I mean, I'm talking about just concept, okay? Is this like a starting engine type of concept? Okay. So, I mentioned earlier, there are various types of technologies on the market today relative to the electrolyzer and to the fuel cell. Uh, those technologies are PEM, proton electron membrane, um, solid oxide, and you have also others like alkaline, which is like the old battery form, uh, and uh, um, uh, carbonate, carbonate something. So the, 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 um, I'll speak about the first two because the first two are the most prominent on the market today. When we talk about fuel cell and electrolyzer, PEM is about 80% of the market, solid oxide is about 20% of the market. Okay, so solid oxide is a niche. They are, each one has a separate attribute. PEM, uh, you can start it and stop it very quickly. So for a mobility application, yes, you start your car, you have hydrogen in the, in the tank, that hydrogen is going to go through a fuel cell, that fuel cell is going to create electricity, the electricity is going to feed the engines, and in between you are going to have a small battery to take on the loads. Okay? So that's your mobility application. Right? And our, my company is not present in that field. The other application, solid oxide, solid oxide you need four to six hours to start up the system, four to six hours, or actually less than that, two to four hours to ramp down the system. So it's not something that you're going to be able to use in mobility, except for marine. For marine, the boat launch going to be for weeks on the on the water. It's okay, but for your car, you're not going to wait four hours to get your car started. Now, why is there an interest for solid oxide? Because the efficiency rate of solid oxide is about 10% more. 
So what I described earlier on about your car, your car is going to, the PEM in your car is going to convert the energy value of the hydrogen into cinetic energy with the electricity one at the pace of 55%. The solid oxide is going to convert at the rate of 65%, 10% more. You take 10% times the number of kilowatts times the five years durability, it's a lot of money, a lot of money. So solid oxide for stationary applications have uh, a reason of being. Um, you, you said it's like a, an engine, it's a generator. Think of it as a generator. The fuel cell technology is known, uh, for, it has been known for quite some time. However, now we are coming to a point where it's ready to be commercialized, to be marketed, to be put uh, in, uh, maybe not in people's home, but at least in industrial environment, where it will generate a lot of uh, electricity at an affordable price, depending on the availability of gas today, hydrogen tomorrow, and do so with a very high conversion rate. I mentioned 65%, 55%. Have, uh, do you know what is the efficiency rate of your combustion engine uh, in your car? You cannot answer that question. <laughs> no? 35%. Yeah, 35%. So the gas that you pump in your, in your tank today as you drive your vehicle, converting the energy content of the gas into cinetic energy, into, into power, at a, at a rate of 35%. So those technologies, are much, much better. They are among the, the best you can get in terms of converting one form of energy into another. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, okay. Do, do you have any technical paper published? Uh, some, not all. Not, uh, we, have, we have patents, we have a lot of intellectual property in what we do. So not, uh, a lot of things we do are not public. <laughs> related to geopolitics. Yes. So uh, the north-south uh, issue where the north mostly had the energy and had the knowledge and the south basically had the, the ore. Now it seems like it's changing because if you want to collect more uh, solar energy or even wind, the south seems more advantaged. However, the, the knowledge and the intellectual properties is now still residing in the north. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, comment on this and how the changes, geopolitical changes, going to happen in the future? So, um, yes and no. So th there are some elements of, of uh, or some sources of solar and wind, uh, which are based in the south, but not only. So yes, because for example, Saudi Arabia is considering investing billions and billions into fields of solar panel. They have lots of sun in Saudi Arabia where they are going to convert that, uh, that solar electricity in hydrogen. So they are already thinking of the post-oil, the post-petroleum era, where if I cannot sell petroleum anymore, what am I going to sell? Well, I better sell hydrogen. And they are already thinking that way. So there are certain countries around the Sahara band, Saudi Arabia, which are, which are thinking that way. Uh, Europe, Europe has the North Sea. There is a lot of wind on the North Sea. So you can imagine like thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres of sea covered with uh, wind turbines. So that's, that's so the dispersion of uh, the, the basically wind and sun is more even than the distribution of oil. So did I answer? I try to, to it's, it's still, it's still the, the jury is still out and nobody knows precisely how things are going to go. What I believe is, is going to happen, though, is that, that that whole story of energy sovereignty, everybody wants like, uh, th that form of energy in their backyard, some, somewhere close to their backyard. So I think that Europe, as they are investing heavily in energy, they are going to focus on the North Sea, they are focused on, on their own turf uh, before they go and invest in other regions of the world. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the countries of the south are absent from that race today. They are, they are absent. I show the, the pictures, uh, US, China, Europe, maybe a little bit Brazil, but that's it. Like uh, Africa is completely out. India is coming up and Southeast Asia is completely out. 
So they, they, are, they are absent right now. So all those technological advances are taking place here in the US, in Europe. global regions and I mean the recent money that's come out of Biden's administration you know just worry how much will be wasted how much <laughs> you know will be replicated as uh -huh. you go around the globe I mean it's a global problem but it won't have a global solution mm -hmm. because the sovereignty issue who owns what it just is messy hmm. so I can answer at the public level there there is very little coordination or cooperation. Those, those blocks are seeing each other as, as competitors, competitors of each other. And uh, energy sovereignty, technological advance is, is seen as being critical to the US the same way as being critical to, in Europe. So those, the, the, the IRA, uh, the, there are lots of uh, actually tariff barriers, hidden tariff barriers, uh, which are baked into the, uh, into the IRA, which are actually limiting the ability of one country to exchange technology, I mean, easily to the others. That's at the public level. At the private level, uh, my company is operating on the three continents. We are operating in, in North America, in Asia, in, uh, in the US, because the demand is present in all three. So the private sector does not see those barriers the same way as the public sees. Yeah, that would be the last one, I apologize. I'm very interested in scalability. You talked about residential. So one of the problems that causes the proliferation of trying to get energy of all sorts around are the people who are rural. How small can the conversion go? Can yeah. you do this in a small town in yes. the UP? Yes, absolutely, yes. So the systems, you saw the picture earlier on, huh? the, the, the system we work on, it's a 20 kilowatt system. Yeah, we, we worked on it with others. Huh? 20 kilowatt system. Your house consumes anywhere between 0 0.8 and 1.2 kilowatt. So what does it mean? It means that 20 kilowatt, you feed like 20, 25 houses. So it's a whole neighborhood. You feed a mall, you feed a school, feed an hospital. So those are designed for very, very like delocalized forms of energy production that rely on the existing infrastructure relative to gas supply. You don't need a gigantic pipeline. You just need your, your regular gas line. You can feed it for like pretty much anywhere. So yes, the, 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 the rural communities in the UP, my wife is from the UP, I have a, a soft touch for the UP. So they, they, will, they can get it and get the electricity as long as they get either gas or hydrogen. Cost effectively, absolutely, cost effectively. Again, it depends what you compare against. The cheapest form of electricity is nuclear. Whatever you do, nuclear is, is the cheapest of the cheapest. Uh, coal is pretty cheap too, and then the, 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 uh, the further away you go, so the, the, the wind turbines, the, uh, the, the solar are still fairly expensive. Huh? compared to, to uh, the, the fossil. So the, I did not talk about one aspect here, which is the economic uh, equation. So the economic equation, it, it's, a, it's a balancing act. So the technology is getting more and more mature, meaning the cost of uh, the, the kilo of hydrogen is going down and down and down. Um, the cost of petroleum eventually is go up and up and up because of the scarcity of the resource. So at one point, we know that for sure, but we don't, we, we don't know how to, or we don't know how to predict exactly when those two curves are going to intersect. With the same efficiency of 65% while scaling. Yes, yes. It, it will, it, comparing to the economics of producing electricity with petroleum uh, versus producing electricity from either hydrogen or methane gas, at some point those two curves will intersect. Otherwise, we would not invest into it. <laughs> That's it. That's it for me. I'll be quick, quick, quick. I don't know. Uh, good question. There is one kilo. So one kilo of water is one liter. And um, I don't know the relative weight of the hydrogen versus the oxygen. I, I don't know. So I imagine it's, it's one third, two third, roughly. Sorry? 
It's one to eight? Okay, here you go, you have the, the, you have the answer. One to eight. Yeah, but okay, yes. Um, it depends, again, where you get the water from. If you get it from your free phreatic nap, if you get it from, from your, your background, uh, or if, uh, it, it, it could be a problem. If you get it from um, collecting rain, desalinating the, the, the seawater, let's not fool ourselves. Water is an abundant uh, uh, resource on Earth. It depends where, depends where. But globally, we have lots of water, we have lots of hydrogen to, or, or the hydrogen has a great potential. Yeah, we cannot take it, we cannot tap that water from large urban area where there is some scarcity. We cannot tap it in the middle of California where there is drought. We, we, we have to be smart about where we use it from, where we take it from. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the, the day. Sunday. Thank you, Cedric. Okay, great. All right, we'll keep moving along here. And uh, our next speaker, um, you know, we saw a lot of the panels out in the lobby here of the Albert Kahn exhibit. They came from Albert Kahn Legacy Foundation. I saw the exhibit here. And I thought this was important because I wanted to talk a little bit about who this Albert Kahn guy is, his impact in Detroit, and how the book depository came about. And then we'll talk about how it's transformed. So um, we have a representative from Albert Kahn. He's uh, uh, actually homegrown individual here went to Lawrence Tech University over 30 years at Albert Kahn. So he's got a lot of experience and knowledge he'll share with us today. Director of Design, Technical Principal, and Senior Designer, Michael Giovanni. Michael? Not sure what the population was in 1900? So, Albert Kahn You'll hear from you. How's that? Good. Uh, there's three takeaways I think from today I'd like to talk about. And that's the innovation of Albert Kahn, Albert Kahn's in on architecture, on architects, and vice versa, and how we're continuing on in that legacy in the firm today. Uh, Albert Debonair there is on the right, brother Julius on the left. And many of the family members were involved in different capacities. So the Detroit School of Architecture, obviously, Khan played a big role in that. There we go. Uh, and, you know, look at George Mason on the top there. So Khan started in George Mason's office, and he was rec immediately recognized for his sketching abilities. So he was um, promoted and asked to enter a competition by what was called the American Architects and, and Builders News Magazine to travel to Europe. So he traveled throughout Europe for a year and produced a myriad of sketches, fascinating sketches that um, are classic. And you can see, I think, the influence of that in some of his uh, classic architecture as we begin to look at uh, Albert Kahn and his work. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. So, not part of the School of Detroit, but a great relationship with Albert. In fact, at a conference here in Detroit years ago, in the 1920s, Wright said, you know there are only two great architects in the world, and the two of us are standing right here. <laughs> so we, we like to tell that story. So there's a, a myriad of great architects there. There's Serenins at Cranbrook, I'm sure you guys are aware of, of that. And then, um, let's, let's move on. But, so the early work. So at the turn of the century, manufacturing, industrial revolution was taking over. And they were looking for architectural solutions to create vast plants for those vast manufacturing processes that were going to go on. And Albert got connected with the auto industry immediately for a number of reasons. For new building systems that he was developing with his engineer brother, Julius, and um, notions about um, natural light and air. So what you see here is the beginnings of the concrete frame. Because up to, up to this point, buildings were built primarily load-bearing. So the walls were heavy and big. 
And so the concrete frame evolved, which made the buildings thinner and lighter, and then the opportunities for large areas of windows for natural lighting and air operable windows. So Julius developed what is called the con bar. So in 1885, and, and, and France, as a matter of fact, uh, the ideas of reinforced concrete were emerging. But Julius really took these ideas and really brought it to the forefront. So you see on the drawing on the left, you can see um, the metal rebar and the concrete in the section there. So concrete is great in compression. And concrete cannot stand up to tension. When you pull on it, it crumbles. It comes apart. Well, steel is great for stretching or for tension. So bringing the two together created a composite design, reinforced concrete. That really was um, uh, revolutionary in providing the structure needed for the heavy machinery and the automobiles that were going to be produced in these plants. Um, about that, you know, that time, about the, the early um, 20th century, Wright was talking about organic architecture and the nature of materials. And I think at the same time, Albert was talking about this organic part of that would be the sciences of, of what you can do with nature. And with these vast plants with no air conditioning and heating issues and lighting issues, this idea was developed of, of the, the stack effect. Sorry about that. Got to go back. Uh, so these, what we might refer to as um, a, a solar um, chimney where they take the natural nature of convection of heat that moves upwards to pull it out of the plants with all the machinery and heat that's going on, and then the architecture of these open clear story windows that allow that heat to escape. And you see that in the diagram here in the lower right. About the same time, um, bridge construction was very important in the uh, evolution of the modern movement. So wrought iron bridges in, in England, in the United States, uh, giving way to structural steel, which allowed buildings to become lighter and to have more clear spans. So the heavy load bearing construction with a tight column grid uh, to carry all the weight was giving way to these lighter structures with free, free span, long span construction. That was important for the evolution of the modern movement. So you see this in um, Wright's building for Henry Ford, um, Highland Park plant, and that's where the, the really the first large-scale plant for Ford where the Model T was constructed. And you see the concrete frame, the reinforced concrete frame, and these open areas for the beginnings of what is called the curtain wall. And so that allowed for a large expanse of glass for letting natural light in. Natural light was crucial in these plants, and then um, venting to let the, the heat out. So this is inside the Highland Park plant. And it's interesting to note that in the center bottom, you see the boxcars. So with manufacturing and the needs for a lot of quantity of materials for Henry Ford and his um, um, innovation of the production line, the boxcars come in, there's overhead cranes that lift all of that quantities of materials to these porches. The porches are precast concrete. It's interesting they have fabric guardrails, but the structure themselves is, is the concrete, reinforced concrete. And so that's how that, that factory worked. But it also created these channels or fingers through this massive building, which again, you can see the idea of the solar shaft pulling uh, heat up through the building, and then the glass letting the natural light in, and then the venting, which was crucial in reducing the heat. You can imagine the, the workers in these unconditioned spaces air-conditioned spaces. Uh, I want to say, Con, recently we've been working with some developers on the drawings on the right. Uh, center is, uh, the idea is about the uh, redevelopment of Highland Park as a new downtown that's near uh, the Highland Park plant. You see that at the bottom. So these fingers are extending out and beginning to mend the two together. The upper drawing shows the same space where commercial spaces, residential spaces, um, office spaces can be uh, utilized in the building. So the, um, you know, the, the architectural critics refer to this as the cat years. And this is an interesting um, aspect of creating the monitors for moving the air and letting natural light in, moving the air out of the building. So obviously with the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution and automobile development, you needed this huge glass plant to create the glass for all of these cars. And you see a section there, you can see the monitors 
where the uh, rich trusses allow these long spans uh, to make the floor open for production. And then the uh, cat's ears or the monitors letting the air out, the heat out, and the natural light in. Khan had um, quite an influence on the development of the University of Michigan campus. So the buildings that you see there in orange, those are all Albert Kahn buildings. And so the first one, number one, which is West Engineering Hall, which we call West Hall today, we renovated that building again in about 2000, year 2000, completely renovated it. But it set up um, the diag. So there's a tunnel in the building. That tunnel is famous for, uh, for some weddings taking place there and um, the students meeting in the tunnel. And you can see that in the image. Uh, and that tunnel set up the diag for the campus. That's why it's such a critical building, West Hall for the University of Michigan. Uh, Khan now was doing the corporate office buildings for the automobile companies, as well as the plants. And this is the uh, General Motors building not far from here. And they were in this building until, oh, I, I don't know, 19, you know, around 2005 or so, where they moved to the Renaissance Center. And the state is in this building now. But the fingers are interesting because they are thin office suites which allow natural light in. So they're not deep, so you can get to the windows. All operable windows, no air conditioning. You could open those windows and cool those spaces in the summer months. And later, Khan was starting to um, develop or think about freeform architecture because of the lightweight construction, the lightweight materials that were evolving. Gave him an opportunity in these exhibit buildings to explore some uh, new ideas about the architecture. So the rotunda that you see here uh, is actually after the fair was dismantled, moved to Dearborn, reconstructed and used as a styling dome. Probably until about the 1950s it burned down and they did not reconstruct it. In ensuing years, the opportunity to work with Ford and GM on these ex exhibit buildings uh, allowed Khan to start thinking about freeform architecture, about movement in architecture. You know, it's very sci-fi-like. I mean, that's pretty cool. And then on the lower uh, right image, you can see, you know, that, the idea is about long span construction and how that was utilized to create the uh, open spaces for manufacturing. So that's part of the exhibit. So if you look to the right or left, you can see the exhibit exhibitors uh, looking down and seeing, watching the automobile process, the construction. So Kahn's influence on the modernists was the idea of the cast, you know, the cast in place concrete frame, reinforced concrete frame you see in the Burroughs building and other buildings like we saw in Highland Park had a great influence on the Bauhaus, which was considered, you know, the mecca, the beginning of the modern movement in architecture. And you can see the influence of the frame. And when you see color photos of this, I should get a color photo, uh, you can distinctly see the frame and then the infill of the curtain wall in both buildings. In 1922, uh, in the 20th century, this was called probably the most important architectural competition of the 20th century was for the Tribute, Tribune Tower in Chicago. You can see Walter Gorpius' um, solution and, and um, uh, entry had the, the, the uh, concrete frame. You can see the influence of Kahn, I think, in that. Uh, Sarinans, who were in Cranbrook, they took a little bit more of a Gothic approach, and Detroit is often called a Gothic architectural city. And you can see some of that influence in that neo-Gothic solution by Aero Saarinen. And then years later, the influence of those competitions on Khan and the idea of Khan's frame uh, utilized in, you know, in, in the location of the windows and whatnot. So it's important to recognize that the Fisher Building is a steel building. And the panels, which are Carrera marble from Italy, are hung in the building. So even though it has that heavy kind of re that um, load bearing wall look to it, it's all hung on the building on the steel frame. And so we call that curtain wall because we're moving away from that heavy loading on the foundation and heavy foundations and bringing all those loads down through uh, continuous loads down through the building. They're hanging on the steel frame, which is much stronger and more flexible for for design. So we see the Fisher Building here, and we can't help but think about the influence of that building on the Empire State Building a couple years later with the stepping. You can argue that the Empire State Building is a little more modern. I think it's neoclassical. And this is where you, know, you can see the influence of Kahn and his studies and sketching when he was in Europe, 
whereas um, the Empire State Building is shedding some of the monument the, um, ornamentation and becoming a bit more modern. Le Corbusier was a famous uh, architect that was uh, one of the inventors, uh, uh, focal point of the uh, modern movement early on. And you can see, again, back to the Highland Park plant of the concrete frame with the infill glass. And you can see that in his book on, which was an important book for architects and young architects back in, that, in the 1920s. And you can see the influence on Le Corbusier's work in the page that's represented there on the upper left, the, the concrete frame with the glass infill. The uh, Glen Martin plant by Old Con, and here's where you can really start to see the idea of the long span construction that originated in thinking about engineering bridges. And you can see that this thing is 450 by 300 foot base, so it's a large bay. So Mies van der Rohe, um, who designed the Barcelona Pavilion, at an uh, exhibit uh, for new modern architecture in Germany. The idea of the Barcelona Pavilion was that it was capturing space, modulating it within the structure, and then releasing it. So Mies had a lot of fun with taking the Martin plant and superimposing elements of the Barcelona Pavilion, some of the sculptures in that space. So this was the idea about universal space in architecture, and that idea about spatial connection to the environment and into the interior and back out to the environment was the universal space. So buildings became much more flexible. And so the long span construction, the layer construction allowed for this, the removal, the compartmentalization, heavy load bearing uh, architecture and construction. This is show um, a bit of the influence of Khan on the curtain wall, the Chrysler Corporation tank arsenal in 41. You can see that the frame has been removed. The frame, the steel frame, is now inside, and it's a complete curtain wall system. This is probably one of my uh, favorite con buildings: is the the half truck, half ton truck building in 1937. Uh, lovely, beautiful representation of this pure uh, curtain wall system, and then the influence of all this on Mies van der Rohe. So this is the Illinois Institute of Technology Crown Hall in 1954. What's interesting and becomes a hallmark of um, Mies van der Rohe's work is that the structure, you see the glass, but the structure is brought to the exterior. So you see the higher element, which is the long span frame with this open flexible space and the um, marching uh, vertical elements that you see there, they're supporting the glass. Normally those are inside and he brought those outside. So it kind of inverted it and you see that in a lot of his architecture and that's a hallmark of his architecture. But certainly the influence of Kahn on, on the, um, the early modernists and later in the uh, mid-century modernist influence is evident. So what is Kahn doing today? How are we using the uh, inspiration for our legacy of innovation and collaboration in, in our projects? So we are maintaining this relationship we have with the auto industry. And this is a recent project that drivability and test laboratory in Dearborn. So this project is on the test track. So that upper left image is showing you the mass of the building that's on the test track. So vehicles are, you know, prototypes are constructed and tested and brought back in and examined after uh, drivability testing. And then you see on the lower right, um, the reduction of the mass. So it's more pedestrian scale on Rotunda Drive. And you can see the idea of the uh, metal curtain wall system with the introduction of the movement in color and in glass, the random locations of glass panels. And then let me mention uh, Sharkey there in the center. So that was one of their early uh, wind tunnel tests, um, uh, um, elements that they had, which they had stored for probably 35 years in the Highland Park building that Ford uses, uh, the Model T building we looked at earlier, Ford uses that now for storage. So it was stored in there for probably 35 years. So they wanted to bring this out and then locate it at this building. Um, and some of the um, employees back when it was in use painted the shark on it. Is, is that the building that's going up on Oakwood right now? Like, is that the... So we are continuing on the relationship with um, the auto industry and with imports. So we did the BMW plant and the Mercedes plant in, uh, in the 90s in uh, Spartanburg and uh, Alabama and uh, 
these are their, actually their very first two large-scale plants in, the, in North America. Uh, we are now just finished up this relationship uh, recently with the Volvo company. So this is in Somerville, South Carolina. Now the buildings are air conditioned and with the, you think about talking about millions of square feet for auto production and the insulated metal panel is hung on the steel structure and it goes forever. And so they need that for efficiency for uh, enclosing these massive spaces. So you don't see the monitors and things like that any longer because of all of the natural, uh, all of the um, you know, mechanical systems and um, air conditioning. So uh, most often, you know, the office building that you see there will get a little more attention. It gets a little more glass for the office workers. Uh, there's this two-story glass element there with some sun shading. About a mile from the plant, we are also doing the Volvo North American Corporate Headquarters building and their uh, Volvo University. So this is the first phase that you see here. It's interesting that we took the frame element and made it more of an identification and a piece of the architecture rather than so much of a support system. And so you can see in the lower two drawings um, of that frame identifying entrances, capping the building, used as a visual element to, to pull the architecture together. And then, uh, more recently, we um, I've been working at uh, Lawrence Technological University, the Taubman Complex. So we continue to innovate and look at um, additional material. So this is called ETFE, and you don't want to know what that means because <laughs> it's just a long, drawn-out uh, name for um, a chemical that's used for creating these plastic panels, which are a tenth of the weight of glass. And so in this particular case at Lawrence, we backlit them. They can be clear or translucent, in this case, to protect visibility for the labs, we made them uh, translucent and then backlit it. So this building is at the, um, uh, it would, would be the east main entrance to the campus, so it becomes a beacon for the campus, so it's really working quite well for the university. Uh, we just finished this building. This is uh, Erie Insurance Group, so we have a tradition of doing large office spaces. And I think that we, you know, we want to talk about the latest trends in office environments, and that's a trend toward collaboration. And so what we've done here is we've created almost a, you know, a look back at the, at the con grid in the areas where the brick and the glass are. And that's the hunker down or the concentrated zones for concentrated work, whereas the glass now is used for expressing the collaborative zones. And because collaboration in the office environment is random, and it's not scheduled, teams decide when they want to meet at any time during the day, and it's a, so we use the glass to represent that. The random mullion work that you see represents that random, uh, randomness of uh, collaboration. And then you can see in the spaces here, which are people-less, because as, as architects, you know, we go in and we photograph the building without people. <laughs> But normally, these would be filled with people collaborating. So um, we put 3,000 square feet of green roof on the building for sustainability. So in the next photo, over heading this way to the right, that is a kitchen area, but it's also used for meetings. So it's set up and designed for meetings throughout the day, and then you can use that for your lunch period. Uh, the lobby has a uh, waterfall feature in it. And then back in that photograph, Second from the right, you see that wood window. Uh, and then that inside that space is just to the next view over. And we call that, the owner calls that the treehouse. And it's the heart of the collaboration of the corporation. So um, they promote um, that aspect of um, office life. We do a fair amount of healthcare. We're probably doing as much healthcare as we do industrial work. And this is the uh, Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital. This was a competition, a year-long competition for uh, Henry Ford wanted us to do. Wanted, they invited 135 firms across the nation to compete for this year-long competition. And it was about the hospital of the future. And so this was, we won that competition. And this is the project that, that, we, that we've done. We worked with um, um, hotels and um, some, actually with, you guys might be familiar with, um, uh, of the school out in uh, Livonia. Oh, I can't think of the name of it. It has the culinary school. Yeah, Schoolcraft. 
So Schoolcraft is sending their chefs in here to do the cooking. And so that was part of this idea of bringing hospitality to healthcare and for comfort for, for patients. So some of the things that we're finding out is that the large atrium spaces, that uh, there, there's a public space and then a reflective, reflective space with a chapel in it. We were concerned about um, how patients would feel about looking into that space. So the center photograph, if you off to the right are the clinical spaces, but to the left side are the patient rooms. And we understand patients love it. They keep their curtains pulled open. They love to see the activity of that space. There's seminars going on there. People come on the, uh, for, for wedding photos on the stairs. Uh, so it's very active. Uh, part of the, the effort that they want to do in making it a destination point and more of hospitality is that there's some shopping in there and there's restaurants in there. So the office workers along Maple Road will go there just for um, the cafeteria knowing that Schoolcraft chefs are, are cooking for the cafeteria. <laughs> so that's pretty exciting. Uh, uh, the Penguinarium. Uh, we have a relationship that's going on for 20 years now with the Detroit Zoo. The latest project is our Penguinarium. And I think it's emblematic of the idea of sustainability in the architecture. So the inspiration here was the Arctic, right? So the building represents that. And so boys that you see in the architecture, the ice caves, the waterfall that's in the center of the building that comes down the building is about the breakup of the ice shelf and the melting of the ice shelf. So the building teaches that in a way, the sustainability issue. And then uh, the, the photograph, the second from the left, that's where you enter the building. And it's really cool because there's a video wall there and you're on Shackleton's ship and you're sailing to the Antarctica. So it's very transforming when you experience the building. And so you're hearing the wind sounds through speakers and uh, the rain, and then there's misters in there. So you feel a little bit of moisture when you walk down the ramp. So this experience of traveling to the Antarctic uh, down into the far left image, which is, well, this has the deepest pool, a uh, penguinarium pool in the country. And so you can go down into the glass tunnel and then walk through and see the, obviously see the penguins circulating above. So we use some ideas about biomimicry and the panel system that you see on the exterior resembles the patterns that are in the feathers of penguins. Future work. Uh, we have uh, a continuing relationship with the Opera House. So we renovated the Opera House in the 1990s. Uh, our recent project, um, is a large-scale project, as you can see, but the upper left is what's being, actually has just been finished, and it's a, a CAD rendering of an elevator tower. So we renovated the building, but what they're finding out is there's a lot of um, ADA accessibility issues, especially with the higher um, areas in the house. And so what the elevator does is allows for um, ADA access to all the levels now, and then it connects some of the office spaces. So that's the first phase of this design. The next phase is to the right is going, going to be an event space, rooftop space. They have that now, but this will be redesigned and re-engineered. And then ultimately an enclosed vent space on the top of the opera house. The tower is something that they're looking at. Uh, let me mention on the far left image, the idea of the uh, solar tower, the solar space, uh, the solar chimney is in, in the, in the design of this building. So there's operable windows on the exterior of that building that are computerized, and they open and close based on the sun location. So they bring filtered and natural air into the building across the floors, and then into a central shaft um, that brings that warm air up through the building and spells the, through the top of the building in the, in the solar room at the top, which has also got plants in it and trees in it. So that'd be a really cool space to, to be in. So. Uh, so the lobby that you see in the, in the lower right, right now in the, in the facility, there are uh, mirrors that are in the archways. So those mirrors would be removed, and then we would open it up to the new lobby space that you see here. We talked about the hospital of the future. We are continuing to work with healthcare groups and thinking about what's the current trends in healthcare, uh, the future of hospitals. And it's decentralized. So this is the same image in the center where the idea was about a concentration, a concentrated community of healthcare. Well, it's turned, moving in the opposite direction, it's decentralized. So yes, in the 
far left you have, lower left you have the mothership, the main hospital where you're with clinical cases, but it's broken down into smaller elements that, and the idea of the colors that you see there, and this is under development, the colored pieces you see there represent different healthcare uh, services that are distributed throughout the community. Uh, we're working in Erie, many of uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, many cities, including Detroit, around the uh, country are going through the process of trying to rejuvenate the downtown areas. And we're actually working on three blocks in the uh, lower left there. I think you can see the three blocks that we're working on where we're renovating existing buildings into uh, food courts and uh, commercial spaces and apartments above. And so it's a combination of renovation, new infill, and new structures. So the one on the upper left, that's actually a new building, but this group wants the buildings to look like they've been there a long time. So you can see more of a traditional look to that building. And then finally, uh, talking about the post office. So this is a con building from 1934. And in 1934, this building was a test bed for the curtain wall system. So often we might think of the curtain wall system as glass and metal. But curtain wall can also be brick and stone, and it's all about the structure hanging. So there's a relief angles that are holding up the pieces of stone and the brickwork um, by floor rather than all the way to the ground. And so that was um, some of the experiments that Khan was doing back then, and there's some of the original blueprint drawings. Now, the one second from the right, you can see the triangular piece there. That's a column top. We call it a mushroom column. Can, can you guys see that? It's kind of not being pointed out, but it's angular. Right there. So um, to order to support the weight of the machinery that's producing the automobiles and the automobiles themselves, these bell-shaped ca column capitals or mushroom column capitals were developed for a, um, a lot more of the reinforcing in there so that these columns and these floors could take a lot of bending from the loads. So that's why there's extra reinforcement and concrete in those bell forms. And we start like to think that on the far right there is, um, is Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Johnson Wax headquarters building with the lily pad columns. And you can see the flares on the columns. So we like to think that uh, Hans' influence and the structure and the look of these things was uh, uh, considered. We're going to have questions after our next speaker here. And let's see. OK. So we uh, talked a little bit about uh, the city of Detroit starting to grow from the industrial era, the automotive, and how it's being reimagined today. We saw Brakan, his impact in Detroit, and even some of the new designs as well. And I hear a lot of the words of collaboration and everything. And we heard Bozel, Cedric from Bozel, talk about his company and how they're reimagining energy as well. And I think that's the opportunity we have here in Detroit with Michigan Central and the Book Depository is all the incubator companies coming to create this new mobility, new technology. And just like the automotive industry before, we had all these car companies. Of course, we only have a few now here in Detroit. But I think that's what we're going to see here, too, is there? Uh, redevelopment, reimagination, our new Silicon Valley of uh, <laughs> the Midwest here. So from Quinn Evans Architects, uh, designers in the book depository here, uh, they've been reimagining with Ford and their team um, the redesign of Michigan Central, the book depository, and what's, what it's going to look like for these new companies and the new workspaces collaboration. So Devin Anderson's here to talk to us today. He's a senior associate at Quinn Evans. He is a past president, or he's the president of Preservation Detroit, past chairperson of Detroit Historic Districts Commission, and uh, has the experience to share with us today. Thank you, Devin. So I do want to clear up a tiny bit of confusion just to start with. Uh, we ended the last presentation with the book depository. Uh, Quinn Evans is working on Michigan Central Station. Uh, the development in Corktown is called Michigan Central, which is a larger development. The station is a part of that. The depository is also a part of that. 
uh, but put out of the design of all the repository. Um, I have a little bit of information about the repository as we as we move. So, as David mentioned, uh, my name is Devin Anderson. I'm an architect with Quinn Evans. Um, I'm in uh, our Detroit office. I actually live a block away from the GM Center, uh, just down the road. Um, I was one of the four project architects who was tasked with uh, developing the renovation drawings for Michigan Central Kitchen. And I've been a project manager for the duration of the construction period and it's been ongoing. I wanted to take a little bit of opportunity today to talk about not just the history and the architecture, but also the sustainability that's baked into Michigan Central Station, because I think those three things kind of uh, play nicely with the previous presentation about the history of our economy. Uh, cutting edge efforts as well. Uh, a little bit about Michigan Central Station. It was designed as a partnership between two architecture firms, Warren and Wetmore in New York, yes. and uh, we did STEM of St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, the two firms had previously collaborated on the Grand Central Station in New York City, um, or actually the same client as uh, Michigan Central. Thank you for joining us today. And we and STEM were known for their design for railroad stations, and uh, Warren and Wetmore were known for uh, hotel, which is why the uh, office tower sort of has a very hotel like. A little bit about the history. Um, Michigan Central Station construction started in 1912. It opened uh, right after Christmas, December 26, 1913. Um, interestingly, the previous train station burned to the ground at 2 p.m., and the first train left Michigan Central Station at 5. So it was rushed into service without a grand opening. Um, and remained in service for almost 70 years. At the time of its construction, it was the tallest train station in the world and the fourth largest building in the city. Um, at its peak between the first two world wars, on a typical day, 200 trains came and went from the station. Uh, about 4,000 passengers hurried through its halls and about 3,000 employees uh, worked the pit. Those of us, you remember that, about 1,700 employees worldwide. So um, later on, after World War II, uh, within 22 years, actually, at the end of World War II, barely a thousand passengers a day used the facility. Um, and in 1968, uh, one of the largest mergers in U.S. history to that time occurred. Um, New York Central and Pennsylvania Railroads merged to form Penn Central, and the station was rechristened. That merger only lasted two years and then resulted in the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history up until that time. Um, and Amtrak was formed shortly thereafter. The bankruptcy happened in 1970. Amtrak was formed in 1971. And they, uh, then we know again, sort of the Bogle angle here. Um, the oil embargoes and uh, cost increases with the gas, uh, with gas in the United States started happening in 1973. Amtrak saw this as an opportunity. Ridership was spiking. They uh, invested a million dollars cleaning and renovating uh, Michigan Central Station, and it had its first three grand opening in June 1975. Uh, later that year, it was uh, put on the National Register of Historic Space Places in an attempt to preserve and maintain it. Um, however, uh, by 1975, you can sort of tell its days were numbered, barely 12 trains. Um, in 1985, the uh, sale of the station was announced. Amtrak service had further dwindled, barely six to eight uh, trains a day. They moved to uh, what we now see up on by the boulevard, very small, amazing. Barely 74 years after the station opened. Um, so then, essentially, uh, the train station over the intervening uh, 30 years was characterized by dilapidation. Um, the building was stripped and looted. A lot of the interiors and appurtenances were sold off, if not sold outright. It became an uh, unfortunate symbol of the economic downturn and the decline in the United States. In 1995, Control Terminals, which was owned by Maddie Maroon, uh, purchased the train station, and a couple of improvements were made over his ownership. The uh, building was finally secured against trespass, asbestos was remediated, a new freight elevator was put in, 
And for good or bad, uh, the new windows that we see in the tower is. Um, over the intervening years, quite a few proposals were uh, rolled out of, about ways to reuse the station, uh, from casinos, hotels, the police headquarters was floated to go there, um, an office for regional immigration and customs was floated there, and of course, they considered them. Um, all the various proposals, demolition among them, cost between 10 and hundreds of millions of dollars in the uh, rehabilitation plan. All the while, the station remained in Cork Town, with silent and smaller and As you can see, this is a little bit more recent uh, image of the, of the area of Cork Town. Um, in 2018, Ford purchased the property from the Maroons uh, with plans to reopen by the end of 2022. You know, that hasn't happened. That date has been pushed to the middle of 2023 now. Um, but the train station remains a centerpiece of. Uh, the uh, Ford's investment in the neighborhood. That's the book of lots of bird building. Um, so there's a total 1.2 million square feet of redevelopment in this neighborhood, of which the train station is half. Um, the plans include at least five different sites the Michigan Central Station, the book depository, a building called the Factory, which is located down Michigan Avenue and currently open. Um, a bag and parking hub, uh, which is located behind the station, um, actually directly behind the station, you can see it in this image, and a future building uh, planned here for the west called actually the west building as a place of um, Correlating to the previous speaker, of course, uh, the adjacent book depository was designed by Albert Kahn. Um, I had read it was completed in 1926, but I saw 1934 on your drawings, so in that era. Um, it was, of course, a post office. Um, however, for most of its later years, it was renamed the Roosevelt Warehouse and was the pub, Detroit Public Schools Book Depository. It was a uh, storehouse for all sorts of surplus equipment, um, sort of notorious in that regard. And in 1987, there was a fire. Um, thankfully, the building survived, but everything inside it was waterlogged and drenched, and DPS abandoned it in place of water. Uh, Ford acquired it in 2018 at the same time as the train station, and its renovation actually was just completed. As we mentioned, tenants have started to move in, and two weeks ago they announced a collaboration with New Lab, uh, which David had mentioned in his introduction. New Lab is an entrepreneurial incubator space, membership driven, based out of um, Brooklyn, New York, and um, they are the uh, first marquee tenant. Um, another partner with the um, Michigan Central district is, of course, um, and more to Did you say Google? Google. Yeah, Google's currently in the uh, Little Caesars Arena. Um, they would be centralizing and relocating their operations, we believe, to uh, Michigan Central. Um, Ford also plans to move 2,500 of its employees to this district. Some have already arrived, and lease space to industry partners. Um, the entire district will be dedicated the colloquialism I've heard is that everything that isn't gas-powered automobiles that Ford does will be centralized in Michigan Central. Um, that includes electric and autonomous vehicles as well as explorations of the future of the moon. Um, of course, this was sort of what we inherited when we put on this first walk to the building. Um, back in the winter of 2018, it was full of uh, ice and snow, um, but a lot of the uh, gorgeous uh, elements of the building remained. Um, everyone was sort of amazed by how well it had weathered uh, the 30 years of, of neglect, and um, we immediately kicked off a top-to-bottom conditions assessment to help Ford sort of refine their cost estimates and understand what this enormous undertaking was actually going to cost. Um, we were joined in that effort by our structural engineer, Silman, and uh, conservators, Jablonski Conservation. Jablonski assisted us with the uh, Boscovina vaults, which you'll see here, and I'll mention later as well as expertise specific to the plaster repair. Thankfully, uh, all three of us have continued to work on the train station to this day. Um, many other firms have sort of come and gone over that period, um, and we're pleased to be among the ones that uh, have weathered it out. Uh, this is sort of a section and an axiometric of the train station itself. Um, it's an 18 story, as I mentioned, 650,000 square foot building. Um, the program of the station aims to give the uh, 
uh, lower uh, public spaces uh, back to the community in terms of um, assembly spaces, gathering spaces, um, restaurants, bars, retail, things of that nature. And then the uh, office, or the, the old office tower would be a mix of uh, Ford offices, offices for um, allied companies, and uh, hopefully a hotel on the top three floors as well. So, uh, because of the size of the project, um, renovation work started early in 2019, shortly after the project was kicked off, while the rest of the building was still being investigated um, and documents were completed for the interior restoration, sort of the last package. One of the first big packages that was released uh, was the restoration of the exterior and the repair of the interior structure. Um, in order to tackle such a large restoration project, the Clint Evans team has basically been producing the packages continuously for the last four years, 17 in total, as well as about 100 bulletins over the course of construction. Um, and while not directly tied to the sustainability of the building, which I'm about to get into, um, all of this documentation allowed the project to succeed and the necessary changes uh, within the building to Being an existing building, um, and this is sort of where we get into the sustainability aspects of it, um, those will talk about it, uh, embodied carbon and net zero carbon and things of that nature early on. Um, by preserving this building instead of building a new building, all of the carbon dioxide emissions that went into producing the various materials that exist and stay there um, are essentially carbon gained um, for, for the environment. Um, there are about 8 million bricks uh, with three glass Pavino vaults, each have about 65,000 overlapping tiles. There's about 125,000 cubic feet of stone, 7,000 tons of structural steel. Um, the floor slabs of the of the building are reinforced concrete, like was mentioned by uh, earlier in the presentation. Um, sort of uh, started uh, or investigated by Albert Kahn. This was more of a New York style uh, reinforced concrete slab, but very similar to concept. Um, and then the foundation uh, of the building, it's uh, basically when they dug down, they never found good soil. Um, it just was sandy, and this is built in a residential neighborhood. So they got down to basically the water table. Um, it's about as deep as the Detroit River is a mile away. And they put a giant four foot thick mat slab down there. Uh, and then built the building on top of that, which is sort of the style of construction common uh, in Chicago. Um, that foundation system has about 20,000 cubic feet of concrete, uh, cubic yards of concrete as well. Um, but I wanted to take a quick moment, maybe, to dig a little bit deeper into some of the uh, some of the specific materials that we used as well. So for the exterior cladding, uh, major materials are brick, iron, terracotta, limestone, and granite. Uh, the base of the building, um, the base of the building here is predominantly limestone and granite, uh, while the tower portion is predominantly brick, terracotta, and um, metal. The uh, the metal predominantly occurs between the windows as an accent, and the terracotta um, is predominantly the decorate, decorative elements along the banding, um, meant, to lim meant, to lim meant to mimic limestone. Um, thankfully, um, almost all of the materials that were put into this building um, 110 years ago were able to be salvaged, or were able to be reused. Um, the main exception was terracotta, which has a tendency to weather fairly poorly. About a third of the terracotta had to be replaced. Um, one of the more interesting stories is about the limestone. Um, we started investigating uh, Michigan Central Station, trying to find an equivalent limestone locally. And our stone supplier actually referred us to the original quarry that was used when they built the train station in the first place. That quarry, in its records, still had all the order forms for the original purchase wow. and had records that a number of stones had been excavated at the same time and placed around their existing quarry. Uh, they used some drones to locate, of course, the forest had overgrown the surroundings, reclaiming these areas. They used drones to find the stones and rescue them, uh, brought them to uh, shops. And because um, one of the other interesting things I learned here was that uh, 
Uh, most stone carving these days is done on CNC machines, computer programs, cutters and lasers that are computer programmed. The stones that we needed to cut were far too big for that. Uh, there were a large number of stones that were cut uh, using CNC machines, but quite a few needed to be cut by hand with artisans uh, to replicate in place uh, what they would be used for. The further advantage was that the stones they were replaced, the ones that were too damaged to remain in place, were also able to be used uh, to replicate smaller elements on the building for in Dutchman to repair stones that had been damaged. So everything uh, went back into the building to be used. When it comes to the uh, interior, the main weight room uh, ceiling, as I mentioned, there are three bays of Wasabina tiles. Um, a, uh, I believe it's a Polish immigrant, um, came to the United States, worked for a while in New York City, um, has numerous patents about this system. Basically, it's a self supporting um, structural masonry, uh, an inherent bone pattern, uh, where the layers overlap and interlock with each other. At the bases of the vaults, there are about 20 layers of masonry thick. Up at the top, 65 feet above the floor, there are about three layers thick. Um, so there's sort of a very graceful arch to these. Um, and again, the vast majority of these you can see sort of in this picture. Um, <laughs> with Jablonski Restoration, uh, a team from Quinn Evans went around the first of the three vaults and hand sounded and hand indicated uh, which tiles were securely attached to which ones. There's a, a, co a co worker of mine, the one who's actually supposed to be here today, who has the flu sample, has an entire presentation about. What was done with the Wasmania vaults, and it's, it's amazing. One vault has about 8,000 surface tiles, um, and thankfully, of those tiles, after all of our explorations and uh, uh, work here, we only had to replace 320. All the rest of them, after being open to the elements for you know, 30 years, having two feet of ice on the back side of this due to winter conditions uh, when we first walked in, uh, the vaults survived. Sort of, um, quite nice. Um, and then this gets in. <laughs> so I almost jumped up when, uh, when the speaker from Bozel was talking about some of this because it talks about uh, carbon sequestration or the amount of carbon that goes into different parts of our economy. As you can see, electricity, agriculture, transportation, industry, homes, and businesses. The production of concrete alone represents 8% of global greenhouse uh, emissions. And that is expected to grow as developments increase. Um, also has a lot to do with China, um, if you read anything about it. Uh, but there are ways to mitigate that. And some of that has to do with um, impacting the way uh, cement and water are used in the process. And one of the things that we leveraged with our structural engineers was to introduce fly ash as a uh, substitution for a certain amount of the cement. Because the cement in this process is what is it's actually weird. Um, a lot of the cement is made by baking limestones at really high temperatures to pulverize them and create the great cement. Um, that energy is most of what goes into the greenhouse gases that are created by concrete. Fly ash replaces the cement in the mix, reduces the amount of greenhouse gases that are created in the production of concrete. Um, and uh, as a, comes with other benefits as well. Um, it doesn't negatively impact the structural performance that much. Um, it increases both durability and workability. It helps the concrete reduce cracking, shrinking, um, makes it less permeable, and creates a dense, high durability concrete that's resistant to both sulfates and other chemical reactions. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, the structural system I mentioned before, the structural slabs on each of the floors were made. Um, in order to uh, repair and improve them, uh, we ended up uh, putting in a new lightweight concrete topping on top of all of the existing structural slabs in the tower. Thankfully, there was about a three inch overburden um, of finished materials, it's mostly cinder and wood floor. That gave us the space we needed to put a new reinforced, lightweight reinforced concrete topping in there, uh, basically throughout the entire tower. Um, and that was another basically uh, 122,000 cubic feet of new concrete. So uh, making the difference here to reduce the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that were created with that concrete um, had a big uh, impact on the, on the building structure. 
Additionally, um, we explored this building in a lot of different ways, um, almost 20 different options um, for different methods to insulate uh, both the tower and the base, uh, different ways to insulate the roof, and then combinations of options um, that resulted from um, we used both energy modeling and hydrothermal analysis to optimize the installation within the building. Um, all of this is just to say, I think the important number here is the 13.5%. Um, because of the uh, dramatic difference between the volume of the building and the surface area of the building, especially in the tower, of the building, where the skin of the building is a very narrow, sort of sail like eye shape, so the exterior skin was higher percentage of the building than the, than the floor plate, focusing the insulation there uh, allowed us to realize quite a bit of uh, energy savings and energy cost savings just to insulate the tower. Uh, we also, of course, um, we didn't just insulate the tower, but these findings allowed us to focus on this. It also allowed us to realize that some of the other um, areas that we might consider insulation on the roofs, lowering the building, um, and even glazing the we're only resulting in like uh, between one and one and a half percent savings in energy consumption for those business sites. So it really allowed us to focus our attention uh, where it would do the most good. Um, the other thing that's sort of interesting here is that we um, employed some fairly dynamic, uh, what's called uh, computational fluid dynamics, CFD model, in order to right size the various systems focused heating and cooling, again, where it would do the most good. So it was kind of a layered approach attacking this from a bunch of different directions. Um, the systems within the building, in and of themselves, are fairly typical 21st century systems. We had the advantage because the building had been gutted that we had to replace everything. Um, all the old coal-fired boilers that were in the basement were gone. Um, basically, every mechanical and electrical system had been completely removed. So we could start over from scratch. Um, all of those systems, of course, allowed us to be far more efficient than the original systems. Uh, there, were talk, there was talk earlier about energy efficiency. I don't know whether we're talking about the same efficiency numbers. Uh, Bozel was talking about 65%. A coal-fired boiler is typically 84% efficient. Uh, the systems that we put in the building, gas-fired, um, hot water systems, are 96% efficient. Um, so there's a savings there, too. You're basically burning fuel to create heat instead of burning fuel and creating electricity. So I think fundamentally it's just a, a, better, a better, it's better to burn things to get warm than it is to burn things to get power. Oh, it's, it's just this. Uh, one of the other things that we did um, was all of our air handling units in the public employ something called CDQ wheels, which is a passive desiccant system that uh, gets the air to the right temperature and humidity using less energy. So that's a fundamental energy efficiency. Um, one of the other sort of interesting things, in addition to the CFD modeling that we did, is all of the new floors and the ground floor of the building, um, those new lightweight concrete toppings, we were able to put, um, it was, let's say, hydronic piping. I don't know why I can't remember. Anyway, we buried hydronic piping in those, in those floor slats so that they could both heat and cool. Um, so those floor slats put the heating and cooling right where the people are, rather than trying to keep this gigantic volume at 65 plus feet tall above so energy savings. Last, um, I wanted to touch on some of the major community aspects of this. Um, there's a current uh, system in the city of Detroit right now getting some mixed reviews, the Community Benefits Ordinance. Um, Ford thankfully bought into that process honestly and conscientiously. Um, they came to the table, frequent meetings with the um, neighborhood of Town. Um, through negotiations, they've agreed to, um, as part of this development, dedicate $10 million directly to benefit the neighborhood um, in Port Town. Um, depending on how those negotiations go, uh, this, this negotiation Ford uh, was engaged in really was one of maybe 10 that's happened so far in the city. And they can uh, deal with things from affordable housing, Park space, and for the dog parks. Um, actually, right down the road here where the Pistons Arena is, it went through a community benefits process too that resulted in community access to the facility. But one of the things that resulted was this uh, fast track job training program. As you can see, this was September 15, 2020, the height of COVID. 
Um, everybody is, is well masked and well PPE. Um, and this uh, job training program, um, the first cohort, I believe this is every person who was in the first cohort. Uh, it was 25 individuals. They worked for four months. Um, they're Detroit high school graduates, recent graduates. Um, they worked directly with the subcontractors, and the subcontractors' bids needed to include the cost of this program within them, uh, which of course were paid for because they're paying subcontractors. Um, and they were actively employed. Um, you know, things like masonry, that we talked about earlier, carpentry, electrical work, painting, iron work, over a period of four months. And at the end of the four month period, over half of the uh, cohort was hired by the subcontractors uh, that they trained. So that is criticism. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. It's been a, a pleasure talking to you all today. And, uh, and thank you, Devin. You know, if you want to have a seat here too, and Michael, if you want to come up here. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for coming out today on this great warm day after the storms. <laughs> we all survived. And hopefully you found this interesting. Uh, what's going on in Detroit? You know, there's our thank you and merci beaucoup, right? Um, we're going to be uh, you know, working on some joint membership programs with the Detroit Historical Society, so you can be a member here and with us, and we'll be doing things like events like this and movies here. Um, you can go to our website, afdetroit.org, and see these events, as well as Detroit Historical Societies. Um, and also, this is the Mois de la Francophonie, the month of the French speech, right? So we've got a lot of events going on like this, and there's one coming up, French Heritage Night, with the Detroit Pistons on March 16th. We had over 200 people last year. Uh, you don't have to be a Francophone, a speaker. It's just uh, a fun night to get out there. There's some music, dancing. You're going to get a nice t-shirt, take a shot at the free throw basket. And Killian Hayes, the French basketball player for us, came and talked to us last year. So come and join us at some of these events. I know some of you came from Ann Arbor and all over the place. We really appreciate you coming out today. So with that, we're going to open it up to questions here. Are we all there? Okay. Oh, yeah. In the beginning, when you showed your uh, bubble chart, you show Saren and Waz had some connection. I was wondering uh, if you can talk about the, the exact relationship between these two uh, architects. Because uh, if I look to uh, Saranan design of the GM Tech Center in War, you use some of the stuff. It looks like to me. I'm not an architect, I'm not, uh, but it uh, looked to me like the, the glass and iron type approach that you described so well on uh, Albert Kahn's side. We see it on Saranan's side too. So. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between these two? Uh, between the Saranans and, and Epworth? Well, to, to be very frank, uh, I, I'm not aware of a relationship between the two. And so um, I suppose there, there was, you know, and I, maybe you should research that. <laughs> but um, I would say that, as you mentioned, the, the influence of the, of the modern movement that Khan had on the modern movement is evident in the buildings that are out there. Texas. Yeah. Hello. Um, I enjoyed both of your presentations. They were both very informative. Um, I wanted to know how long did it take for you to find that you love the things you do? like the jobs you have, because I imagine to stick with this um, redesign of the transition, you must really love what you do. Yeah, I mean, I, just in the interest of going back and forth, um, I think I had sort of decided uh, in high school that architecture was what I wanted to do with my life. And it wasn't really for any particular special love of buildings, strangely enough, nor even after I had graduated from architecture school was I particularly dedicated to historic preservation until later in my career. Um, I had looked at the things that I did in my free time and the things that motivated me personally, the things that I enjoyed doing, um, and noticed uh, an appreciation of math and science and art, reading, um, and things like that. And I felt that architecture was the best way to combine all of those interests in something 
that would allow me to work for the next 40 years of my life without hiding scotch in the desk drawer. You know? And <laughs> he doesn't hide it, it's right on the desk. And he's also a Detroit product of architecture, University of Detroit Mercy. Yes, indeed. Okay. Great school. Well, uh, I guess mine goes way, way back. I, I can remember, um, you know, Basel Company is talking about being a Livonian. That's, that's where, you know, my family uh, it's from and that's where I was raised and I, I can remember in the sitting in the living room you know uh, when I was probably four or five years old drawing bridges I was fascinated by bridges and then my dad walked up and said yeah so you're gonna be a bridge engineer I said no I'm gonna be an architect so something inside me has just always been fascinated with that and uh, it's always been you know reinforced I, I like Albert, you know, I was always sketching. I sketch all the time still to, to today. I think you saw some of my sketches in the, the presentation. And you know, I use um, CAD software for renderings. Uh, the, uh, the sketches are, are important because um, our clients, it's, it's really interesting how they really like the sketches. You know, um, so much of our work is, is done in, com in computers and computer renderings. And the sketching process is important to clients that, that, I've, that I've discovered. And it's not just the older clients, it's the younger, the younger CEOs that love the sketch process because they feel like they're part of it. And they can, in sketches, you know, I think they can read into it things that they want to see and they want to talk about. When you show renderings, computerized renderings, it's like, wait, it's over? You know, <laughs> we haven't been part of the process of deciding what it looks like. And so that's, that's been the beauty of um, sketching. And I just picked it, up, picked it up at a young age and just stayed with it. Each of us have a purpose in life and a calling, and uh, that was it. <laughs> I also commend you for what you're doing. Um, I have been to many con buildings, so many I can't tell you, and I know that a lot no longer exist of the 8,585 B-24 Liberators built at Willow Run, there are precisely zero left that fly. So I'm curious um, if either of you know how many con buildings still exist uh, or, and or how many are still visitable. Well, uh, and our company actually, we're up around the 35,000 range of buildings across the, uh, the world. And, um, you know, it was interesting. I remember reading an article years ago and they were, they were, it was just a discussion about an industry in Detroit, which was a demolition industry. And they had mentioned that when we come up against a con building, you know, it's quadruple because of the, you know, the precast construction, the, the, the port and face const construction with the reinforcing. And uh, those mushroom columns, those those bell columns, you know, they're massive, and they're and to this day, you know, um, they have mentioned the fire, and uh, in in some of our books, it talks about the fact that the structure with that fire, with all those books and papers in there, the structure survived, and it's still there today and being renovated. It's because of that, um, you know, concrete system, the um, the weight of it, you know, the strength of it. It could resist those fires and uh, live for another day. Good afternoon. I just have uh, a question for both of you. Having majored in French and lived abroad for a year at 20 years old, ended up in Chicago and uh, between two job offers, one at a French bank, and the other for Helmut Jan. I have PTSD, which is why I'm back in, in Detroit. Um, my question is, how many, if you could guess, how many of your employees are bilingual? I was hired on the spot at Helmut Jan's office because he was building the Hyatt Regency Wasi. And I opted not to work in the human resources department. Looking forward to the donut cart at Credit Agricole. 
um, with mostly women. And I went to a women's college, lived in Paris. So my question is, if you could guess how many bilingual employees do you have in your office here in Detroit? Thank you. Oh, could you repeat the question? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't How many hear. bilingual employees do you think you have? Oh. Uh, well, here in Detroit. In Detroit? Uh, well, let's see. We, we uh, you know, I, I don't have a count for all that, but over the years we've had bilingual people in the office. And um, we, we've enjoyed that when we get resumes for those people because we could see the advantages of, uh, you know, knowing a second language and helping us. Because we do projects around the world and we'd like to continue to do that. So that is an advantage for us. So in the office today, I would say, I probably think I can think of two. Out of how many do you have? Uh, well, <laughs> it's kind of interesting, you know, um, we, uh, in 2000, we had 485 people. And so um, with 9-11 and what it did to our economy, and uh, that in combination with um, automation, with computers, our office uh, over 10 years went from uh, 45, 200, 225, 100, 120, uh, 90 or so, so about 100 people. Yeah, a lot has to do with automation, but um, so I really appreciate your question. Um, I feel like as somebody who dabbled in foreign language myself, um, I like to think of myself as, although not a French speaker, um, somewhat bilingual, um, but I am, not, I am not a native speaker in my, in my second language. Um, so it's, it's something close to my heart. Um, Quinn Evans is mostly a, uh, I don't, terrestrial isn't the right word, but we mostly uh, keep to work within the continental United States. So anybody who is bilingual at Quinn Evans is bilingual by happenstance or came to us that way. Um, I would say 2% is probably a fairly good ratio uh, based on the number of people I know who have English as a second language. Um, we are also a firm of 200 people. Um, in that range, but within the city of Detroit, our office is only uh, between 25 and 30 on any given day. Um, most of our, uh, our largest office is in Washington, D.C., and services the, the federal government, National Park Service. We occasionally do an embassy, so there is some call for that, um, but it's um, not something that, that, I've, that I have a handle on. To your point, it's kind of relative to the work that you're doing, and also here in Detroit, we have a lot of uh, French company, Stellantis, formerly Chrysler, that is now a French company, Parisia, Valio, Cedric uh, is French. So we have a lot of uh, French companies. French is one of the top languages. Canada's experienced a lot of immigration from Africa that are French francophones that are working with us. And we're here to promote the French language as well. And, uh, but we want to engage community cross culture. Well, let me, let me add, we, we had an office in Sao Paulo with uh, probably 40 people for qu quite a long time. And with, you know, they, they went through some serious economic issues there, so we had to close the office. Interestingly enough, a um, number of the employees have um, immigrated to the United States, not so much to Detroit, but uh, <laughs> in Florida in particular. They didn't like that ice So score. Portuguese. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just like to ask you the question regarding the energy conservation. And uh, I know, uh, I should say maybe as a trend, a lot of companies use like a solar panel, solar panel, you know, or you know, just use the, some uh, natural lighting, something like that. Uh, I'm wondering how much uh, do you use the Geothermal technology. I'm talking about a, not a volcano geothermal, like a heat pump. So I know that um, heat pumps have a lot of advantages. 
Um, number one of which is they're uh, inexpensive to install and they use existing technologies. You typically hire a, a regular rural well drilling company to, in, to, to drill the geothermal wells. Um, one of the things that um, Bozel didn't really speak to, um, I didn't either, is the growing electrification of uh, our building stock, is that as we tie heating and cooling and other systems within the building to the electrical grid instead of natural gas, I think we all heard about the crazy natural gas stove thing that, that blew up earlier this year, not literally blew up, but media-wise, um, that there's been a gradual push towards electrification and heat pumps are key within that, um, within that system. Um, that if you're going to heat and cool a building, especially in, a, in an environment like we live in here in Detroit, uh, heat pumps are a cornerstone of that unless you are hyper insulating your buildings and going for, for a net zero energy kind of scenario. Is there a summary on what a heat pump does, how that works? Who? I fumbled over my hydronic piping earlier. I am not an engineer. I, uh, I have signed documents that say that I will not try to talk about engineering because I'm an architect. <laughs> um, but fundamentally what a heat pump does um, is it takes uh, a, usually a glycol system, pumps it into the ground so that it uh, achieves an ambient temperature, usually around 50 degrees, and then leverages that. You may know better than I do, actually. And then it left, yeah. So the electricity that's used is used to pump the glycol around and it uses this 50 degree base to supplement heating in the, in the winter or to power cooling in the summer is conceptually, I believe, how it works. You may know better. Well, uh, I, I, I signed the same contract. <laughs> so we have, um, you know, a multidisciplinary firm uh, and um, we have engineers, structural engineers, electrical engineers in the office, which, which is great for architects because you can, you know, go, go down across the building or, or down to the next floor and uh, talk about, you know, mechanical systems for your, your building and how the architecture needs to respond. So there's another, um, yeah, I'm um, maybe on thin ice here, but <laughs> there's another concept that we use. It's called in the, in the, in the uh, Volvo office building. We use chilled beams, and so that's a device um, that's hanging in above the ceiling. And there's um, with chilled beams, um, you know, the, I, I, if I got this right, you know, the idea is that um, there's direct air from the outside to the chilled beam. So it starts to reduce the amount of ductwork that's required and the amount of um, supporting um, uh, mechanical systems that need to feed that. At the same time, it's also get there is a, a because the chilled beam has a um, level area of operation, you know, it still needs to be supplemented by direct heat from boilers and, and uh, air handlers, but it does reduce the amount of it. How do you consider the, the, the changing future where right now we have gas powered cars? We also have, have these other potential in the future. I can take a stab at it. Um, so, over the course of my career, um, I've worked for the past 20 years for four or five firms, most recently for Quinn Evans. Smaller ones will tend to in house try to perform as much of the architectural service pie as they can. Um, so when I worked for a small 10 person or five person firm, we would do all of the work. We would try to do all of the site planning. We would sometimes do the landscape uh, architecture. We would hire engineers who would do the engineering and we'd do their drafting. Um, so there's a, f a fair amount of that stuff that in, in my previous life I used to do. Um, as the firms get larger, simply due to liability and efficiencies, they tend to either onboard engineers or outsource those, those work to specialists. So like, for instance, with Michigan Central Station, there were landscape architects, there were civil engineers, there were um, transportation engineers who studied the movement of, of bodies around the space, within and without the building. Um, fundamentally, um, and this is purely due to cost and expediency, and 
to some degree developer pressure. When a site plan is developed, it very often is driven by the requirements of the zoning ordinance in the city in which it's built. So the city has parking requirements. The city has exceptions uh, where you know a certain number of motorcycle spaces can replace a certain number of car spaces. Uh, the city may also have requirements these days for electric charging stations. Ford as well may come to the table and say, we want a certain number of our parking spaces in all our buildings and developments to be electric vehicle ready. And there's a lot of very interesting uh, both wireless and wired charging that is planned around the train station as a result. Um, the problem you run into is that a lot of the things, and I'm not gonna say the things you mentioned, but the things that Michigan Central is ideating about, if that's a word, don't exist yet. So there's like no way to plan for them. We have um, a bunch of materials that kind of would appear in renderings, we talk about computer renderings. We'd have these little robots that Ford has that are like gonna deliver people's packages and they look like little spiders. And, Nothing's been made. No factory is making these things. Like, and there's an, there's an idea that, similar to the Meyer model, where you know, large self-driving um, semis are going to go to central locations and then UPS trucks are going to deliver from there, that influences maybe the way a site is planned because the long-term experience is that we're not going to have semis queued up in a lot of these areas, it's all going to be on demand through smaller vehicles, and that accommodations for larger vehicles may only be temporary. So like, where I was going was, like parking lots and infrastructure and ramps and charging stations are, are heavy duty investments, millions of dollars on a site, and that the tendency is for those improvements to lag behind the actual technology they serve, rather than to get out in front of it. Um, I think Michigan Central is a special case because it's intended to be on the bleeding edge, um, but it also is only going so far in that direction. Well said. <laughs> I, could, I could add to that, you know, we, with our in-house um, engineering, we also have um, urban planners. So we, we look at our projects from uh, not just the site, but from the surrounding environment. And we have large master plan, planning projects that we do, and I think I, I hinted at some of them. The Volvo building that I was showing, the office building, uh, we didn't, didn't show in those images the parking lot, but there's, there's curving park, parking lots um, off to the right and left of that building, and Volvo's made provisions for um, charging stations and conduit and placement for future charging stations. And you know, Volvo had made that commitment to be 100% electric vehicles. I think they missed that mark, but they're still working toward that. There's even three charging stations at the parking lot here. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there are. You know, at the same time, it's interesting. We, we have a, we're master planning for, it's confidential for a large corporation that's in an urban environment. And we're looking at um, parking decks, as long as, as, along with, you know, other amenities, office buildings and, and theaters and whatnot that's required for their, their campus. And they've asked us to look at the parking decks and design the parking decks that they can, can be converted to office buildings. Typically, you don't design parking decks like that with ramps and whatnot. You know, you, you can't really convert them. So we got to design parking decks that are convertible to office buildings. And their reasoning is with enriching the urban environment and bringing people, they want to bring people into the city, they see the, a reduction in the use of private automobiles. Back to the uh, one thing... Uh, I missed it. When the project, what was the amount of funds before So that's a that is a really good question and one that I don't know the answer to fundamentally. There are um, certification strategies. Uh, lead is one of them where you're weighing and quantifying the waste that rolls off a, rolls off a uh, job site. Uh, Michigan Central didn't quantify that waste. Um, having been abandoned for 30 years, there was quite a bit of um, debris in the building, both debris that started there and debris that ended up there. Um, but in terms of the tonnage, I know uh, I'm working on a project at the Dearborn Inn that's fairly similar, um, also for Ford right now. And we're estimating the weight, this is again just weight, 
the weight of what is kept by the, versus the weight of what is removed as an 80-20, where 80% of the weight, just because the heaviest things, concrete, steel, foundations, brick, things like that are staying on site, and the lighter things, metal studs, drywall, carpet, things like that are what's going away. I wouldn't be surprised if Michigan Central was in a similar 80, or the station was in a similar 80-20 arrangement, but that's really rough, really rough estimate. We have time for but one more question. If we have one. Architectural work. You talked a little bit about it, but you take a look at some of the cities already talking about not allowing personal vehicles. So they limit and they have radius around the city where personal not people are trying to do the work. Actually, one of the outcomes is what you see about the all around the, the different cities. That's actually a bleeding from this project. LA is one of them. So I was wondering if it was during the work you were doing, either central, your projects, you already saw these requirements where people cannot anymore. We see it in Europe, actually. Bring any more their personal view. Yeah. The mic. Oh, that's okay. I, I um, I'm enjoying your comments. <laughs> so, um, no, we haven't had any clients or any situations where that's come about. But I have heard uh, in various um, news media and whatnot about some movements toward that. I was going to say sort of the same thing. There's been some really interesting press lately about cars repossessing themselves. Um, that might encourage people to not own one, um, as well as um, just the very fact that if you think about it, we've been here for two and a half hours and our cars have been sitting in the parking lot. You know, if our cars are self-driving, why would we waste that resource in that way? Um, I think the Uber and Lyft model, when combined with autonomous vehicle technology, has the tendency, if Americans are on board for it, to get rid of, in a large extent, the private ownership of vehicles which will have a dramatic impact both on parking structures and our urban fabric. Um, I think um, it's a very exciting concept because our cities have been so auto-dominated for the last 80 years um, that having public access to private transportation, if that's a thing, um, could be a game changer in terms of these things. I know that the station was redeveloped with the thought of ride share and other things being a primary motivator for people getting to the, um, ride share is the wrong term, I'm referring to Uber and Lyft, uh, for people to get to the buildings um, as well as some of these other uh, technologies, um, and that the whole purpose for this campus is to explore all of those exciting options. There was actually recently an article in the paper regarding, I think it was Stellantis, as subscription cars. So if I need a car for a week, if my insurance and everything's taken care of, for a day, I need it for a month, I don't own a car, I Rent it what I need. Right, right. Well, I read an interesting article about uh, parking in Tokyo. So um, you can imagine the density of Tokyo. So if you live in downtown Tokyo to afford parking, a lot of residents have an hour, they claim an hour commute to get to their car where it's parked. <laughs> so that's really kind of fascinating to think about. Get out your bicycles. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So can I just, one more comment. So your comment about um, Saradins and, and Alper Khan, there, there must be some relationship there because we're aware of the work that uh, Albert was doing with, with Henry Ford. And uh, Henry Ford was instrumental in bringing the Saradins to Detroit, to Bloomfield Hills. So there's probably some connections there that I'm unaware of, but I'll have to research that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, th th because I think it's they're still part of the school of Detroit, you know, architectural school of Detroit, even though maybe um, a lot of those participants on that chart moved back and forth be between Khan's offices and others, and some of them were partners with Khan's that spun off their, their own office. So I think if you're talking about the Detroit School of Architecture, I think you can't leave the Saranins out. Yeah, so that's why they're on the, on the list. Okay, well, I'm... On behalf of Alliance Francaise de Détroit, I'd like to thank our host, Gracie, with the Detroit Historical Society, and our speakers, Devin and Michael, 
and all of you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Grab a cookie and a drink on the way out. Okay.